Good evening. Good to see everybody this evening. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue on. Our dear gracious Father, we thank you and praise you for the privilege to gather together, for the blessing of being able to sing praises, especially for the salvation that we have in our Savior Jesus Christ, for the love that you shed abroad upon us, for the care that you give to us. And Father, we thank you for this blessed time to be able to set aside the cares of the world and come and gather here and to, to glean from your word what you would have for us so that we might be changed according to your will. Father, we ask that you would calm our hearts and help us to be attentive to your word. And, and Father, we pray for those that are, aren't with us that are traveling. We pray for those that are um, that uh, are away on the road for work or whatever reason. We thank you for Cutter and Larrabee being back with us. And we just pray now that you'd continue to bless and guide, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You may be seated. All right. Well, let's see. Last week... We did our listening tally sheet for the kids, and, I, and Arena was the best listener again. Yeah, so I'll let you pick out your prize later, okay? All right. Who wants to pass out tally sheets for this week again? Would you like to do that? All right, got lots of helpers, so here. You, uh, you take a few here and pass them out. All right, you take a few and pass them out. All right. A lot of them, so if some of the adults want to listen along and ca add them up too, you can. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see who, who's the best listener. Well, this week um, we, we've been studying in 1 Corinthians, but uh, for, for today's lesson, I'm, I'm going to, we're not going to be studying in 1 Cor Corinthians. We're going to take a break from that for just, uh, well, at least this week. But um, there's been some things going on in the, in the news. So yeah, for the, the tally sheets there, if you, see, if you hear me speak one of these words or some deriv der <laughs> derivative of this word, for, for example, and this doesn't count child, if I say children, that counts for child, okay? So you put a tally mark there, and at the end we'll see who got the most and who was listening the best. All right, kids? All right. There's been some things going on in the news, of course, some really terrible, terrible things uh, last few days, but um, I started developing this lesson uh, actually before the events that took place down there in Texas, and unfortunately, that's, uh, that's covering a lot of the news here right now, but um, there's been some things going on in churches uh, that... Um, it's becoming pretty obvious that a lot of churches have some big problems. The Southern Baptist Convention, for example, is facing huge problems because of their mishandling of allegations of abuse uh, within the leadership and staff of their organization. And so you can read about this in various articles and, uh, you know, somebody makes an allegation and and uh, instead of taking it seriously or, or looking into it, a lot of times it's been uh, glossed over or the person making the accusation is actually accused of doing something wrong. Closer to home, a recent article in the Sunday newspaper highlighted allegations of abuse and misconduct at a local independent Baptist church. And so problems like this, they develop over time and they reflect a culture of fear, a culture of authoritarianism amongst the pastor and the leadership. And uh, that kind of leads, that fear and authoritarian, uh, authoritarianism leads to cover-up. And so I'm not going to comment on, you know, any of those particulars, the, the Southern Baptist Convention or the church that was in the newspaper. But, but what it does is it gives us an opportunity to take a step back and learn and listen and kind of reflect on our own culture that we have and our own congregation and how we handle things and uh, reflect on our practices, how we do things. Uh, and I think that's good. I think that's constructive because uh, we would be foolish not to learn 
and take notice of things that go on around us. So we have established within our church here some practices that are, that are meant to reduce the likelihood of any kind of abuse or misconduct occurring on these premises. We have a, a risk management and response plan that's been developed to guide us uh, in mitigating any instance of misconduct. And it also provides a means for reporting the misconduct so that it can be addressed. And thankfully, we haven't had to use that in, in terms of misconduct or anything ever. So, but we have a plan in pr place. So we have a, a, we have a system, for example, of our practices. The kids don't go downstairs during services. Nobody goes downstairs unaccompanied. We all stay up here together. And, and these may seem like rules, just to have rules, but they're for a reason. It's to keep us all safe, and especially for, uh, for our kids, to keep our kids safe. Um, this, th this, that plan that we have covers our church facilities. But what's on my heart tonight goes beyond our building, our walls here, our, our, where we meet and where we fellowship. And we, our, our church culture and the way we operate and the way we treat each other should always reflect the love of God through Jesus Christ. It should always exalt Jesus Christ by our behavior. And we should always be in the position of being willing to promote others before ourselves. But some of the allegations which have made, been made against churches involve abuse which has occurred in the homes because of the teaching that has come out of the pulpit. And that's my concern today, is that uh, what comes out of the pulpit can be misconstrued or even taken and used as an excuse that leads to inappropriate behavior at home, at the work site, you know, wherever we go. The accusations that are being made is that parents are encouraged from the pulpit to beat their children, sometimes violently, and this has prompted other abusive behaviors in the homes. And furthermore, when church leaders are informed of the situation, they don't address it, and the abuse continues, and it even seems to be more encouraged. And those raising the accusations are themselves, usually the church accuses them of doing something called sowing discord or creating division within the church, and that ought not to be. Uh, we need to take everything seriously. And so what I want to go do this evening is take this opportunity just to present a clear biblical guide on disciplining children so there's no confusion on the matter, okay? So in other words, so that you can say, no, what, what uh, those accusations that are being made in other churches, that doesn't happen here, all right? Because what you're going to hear from the pulpit is straight out of the Bible, and I think it's a, it's a broad and even-handed approach to disciplining children. And uh, a it's meant to be constructive for our children. We want our children to grow up to love the Lord. We want our, our children to grow up to love other people, to respect other people, to be able to um, handle the situations and the problems that come along in life in a constructive way. And we want our children to be able to have the uh, ability to, um, to, to grow up into be, to being strong, balanced adults. So I want to start with, let's, let's differentiate between discipline and punishment, okay? What is the difference between the two? I, 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 love, I got my, diction, uh, my definitions out of Webster's 1828 dictionary from the 19, or 1828, uh, I love that dictionary. He gets into some really good d definitions. He says, discipline is the education, instruction, cultivation, and improvement, comprehending instruction in arts, sciences, correct sentiments, morals, and manners, and due subordination to authority. So that's discipline. Um, it's, it involves instruction, education, and, and how to, not only in the arts and sciences, but in what are proper morals and, and how to submit to authority. 
things like that. A good synonym for discipline would be training, and in some cases, a good synonym is restraint. Uh, to be disciplined is to be restrained. Now, punishments, on the other hand, sometimes they're used interchangeably, but they really shouldn't be. Uh, punishment, in most cases they shouldn't be. There's times when they could be. But punishment is, now listen to this definition carefully out of Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Any pain or suffering inflicted on a person for a crime or offense by the authority to which the offender is subject, either by the constitution of God or of civil society. The punishment of the faults and offenses of children by the parent is by virtue of the right of government with which the parent is invested by God himself. This, this species of punishment is chastisement or correction. Did you catch that? If you went and told this, gave this definition at a parent at a school board meeting nowadays, they'd call you a terrorist. I'll read that again. The punishment of the faults and offenses of children by the parent is by virtue of the right of government with which the parent is invested by God himself. In other words, parents have the right to punish their children. And that is a God-given right. That's, that was right in Webster's Dictionary, which is, boy, that does, that's not too politically correct today, is it? But that's what uh, Webster defined. Now, I'm, I want to go ahead and define abuse as well, because that's a word that's, that's thrown out there a lot. It means the ill treatment of another person. Abuse violates another, another's natural rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We can violate those rights. And not even parental rights usurps a natural rights, since parental rights are for the express purposes of protecting the natural rights of our children. Did I say that too fast? Did I make that confusing? The abuse is when we... we we um, violate another's natural rights, right? And yet parents have a God-given right to even to be able to punish their children when necessary, but we don't have, we, don't, we are not allowed to abuse that right that we have. We are not allowed to abuse their natural rights. And so that puts their natural rights above our parental rights. Yet we still have our parental rights, and so we still have to discipline and punish as necessary, but not abuse. Abuse comes when we violate those rights of that child in, in, in a way which is not positive for them, okay? Parents have a duty to train their children, and if necessary, inflict punishment in order to train them towards good behavior and developing that self-restraint. God does that very thing for us. The Lord chastens us. In Proverbs 3 and verses 11 and 12, the scripture says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Because the Lord loves us, he will correct us. He will do things to get our attention. He will turn us away from a path that we may be on, and we may call it circumstances or, or chance or things like that, but it's the Lord working to move us in a direction that's going to be harmful for us. The Lord will chasten us. He'll get, he'll get our attention. Now, when it comes to parents and children, the Bible makes it really clear that the rod is, to be, uh, is not to be withheld when it is called for, but must always be administered in love. Um, Proverbs 13.24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. So if you withhold... Uh, punishment, the rod is synonym for punishment, 
if you withhold that, it's a sign you, uh, when it's necessary. If you, if you withhold it when it's necessary, that's a, that's a sign you don't love that child as much as you should. Proverbs 23, verses 13 and 14 says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now, as I read these next several verses, they're all you know, similar uh, to what I just read. You'll probably recognize that, that in some cases, that's about the only message that's preached out of the pulpit for how to discipline your children. But that's not the case. We're going to read these because they're in the Bible and they're true and they're, they have their place. Proverbs 20 and verse 30 says, The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. Now, sometimes and oftentimes, and, and I've even gotten this twisted around my mind too, this does not preach that you beat your kids till they're black and blue. <laughs> this is not what this is say, saying. It just says, just like a bruise shows that there's, there's, the wound is being cleansed because you can see it in the bruise, right? Also, stripes, the spanking, cleanses the inward parts of the belly. In other words, the heart, the soul, okay? So this is not a, and, and this has been preached and I've heard it, that uh, you, know, you, you, have, you need to, to spank a kid till, till they're black and blue. And that, that's not the case. That's not, um, that's not what this is teaching. This is, a, this is a simile, right? A simile, because it's just like the, 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 the bruise is a sign of cleansing, so are the, the, the stripes of spankings. Proverbs 29 and verse 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So the rod and reproof, rod and reproof. Notice there's two separate things here. The rod is punishment, reproof would be discipline. They, they give wisdom. And a child that doesn't have this brings his mother to shame. Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. If anybody's got a spanking can say, Yeah, no, that didn't feel very good. <laughs> that was grievous, right? Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So it, it's meant to produce a change and to produce fruit. Proverbs 29, 17 says, um, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Correction is good. Correction is necessary for our children. And so we see the instruction here related to spankings, if you will, but the Bible makes it really clear that the punishment, this form of punishment, uh, the rod is for the backs of fools. Okay? Proverbs 22 and verse 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Okay? So that's what the rod is for, when one has been foolish. Now, the definition of foolish, that means you got an F on your report card? No. It means you, you have not listened to instruction when it was offered. You refuse to listen to re reproof. You refuse to take the admonitions that were given to you, and you went ahead and did what you wanted to do anyways. And so that's where when the rod is applied. And, and so that's the definition of a fool, okay? That's they, they will not receive instruction. They, 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 they turn their back to instruction, and that's what the rod is for. Proverbs 10, 13 says, uh, Proverbs 10, 13, the, In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. Proverbs 26, 3 says, A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. Now, parents, you don't have to answer this out loud, okay? I'm going to ask you a question. Is your child a fool? Well, there's foolishness bound in the heart of a child, in every child. We have to unlearn that. 
But a fool, as I said, is someone who will not accept instruction when it's offered. Instruction must be offered before the spankings are doled out, okay? And that's where a lot of this teaching on the rod gets, it stops with the rod and it doesn't go into the understanding that the rod is after instruction has been doled out. A wise ear, kids listen to this carefully, okay? A wise ear will hear rebuke and repent without a spanking, okay? A wise ear, Brother Carl and Sister Florine and Joy and I were talking about this very thing the other night. It was already on my heart before then. I'm glad that conversation came up when we were talking about it. But, you know, there's, there's some kids, they're tender. And all you got to do is look at them. You know what you did was wrong. And they'll never do it again. That's wisdom. <laughs> That's that's a child who figured it out without having to have the stripes across their back or their bottom. And some kids are more tender that way. Other kids can be a lot more stubborn. Proverbs 1 and verses 5 and 6 says, A wise man will hear and increase learning. So what does a wise man do? He hears and he gets smarter because he listens. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. In other words, he'll look after wisdom. A man of understanding will seek out to get wisdom. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. He'll want to understand things. Proverbs 10 and verse 8 says, The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. Prating means to talk foolishly or at tedious length about something. Prating fool. Somebody who's just talking all the time and not listening, okay? The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool, somebody who's just talking all the time about anything, shall fall. Proverbs 12, 5 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Listen to counsel and grow and become wise. Kids, this is why I asked you to listen intently here so that you can understand how you can get smarter, how you can be trained to be a, a, a healthy, productive, wise grown-up is that if you will seek after wisdom and if you'll listen to the good counsel that's given to you by your parents. Proverbs 13.1 says, A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. In Proverbs 15, verses 31 through 33, The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. But he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. The wise ear will hear reproof and rebuke and will not need the rod. Okay? And you know it's that way with the Lord too. If we will take, if we will take to heart what we read in the Bible, if when we are convicted of sin, when the Holy Spirit leads in our life and convicts us of sin and we recognize we've done something wrong, if we will repent of that and change, that's a delight to the Lord. The Lord loves that. When we, He loves to show mercy. And He will show mercy when we repent of sin and we turn away from it. He will bless. He will show mercy. But if we don't, He still loves us. But he's go, his, his response to us is going to be completely different. His response to us is going to be one of chastisement, one of, well, it looks like I've got a fool to deal with here instead of a wise son that's going to listen to the counsel that I give him. That kind of, that kind of a response. Now, rebuke's a good thing, but you know what? Too much rebuke is also abuse, and it leads to a hard-hearted child. 
Proverbs 29 and verse 1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without rem remedy. Constant, you didn't do this right, you didn't do that right. Constant reproof. Why can't you do this? Why aren't you like your brother? Why don't you do, why don't you do this? You know, you know, this constant reproof. Everybody's different. Everybody's going to respond to that differently. But in general, especially with tender-hearted kids, when you only need to reprove them once, and they're going to get it, they're going to listen, that constant reproof is going to harden the heart of that child so that they're going to not listen anymore, and you've just created a spiral to where because they're not listening, now you feel like you've got to inflict a punishment of some sort, and that makes things even worse. And so that creates a downward spiral when it comes to actually training, training our children. Ephesians 6 and verse 4 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And too much uh, rebuke is, is a form of abuse as well. Verbal and emotional abuse is one of the most destructive forms of abuse that there is because it tears down a child's self-confidence, tears down the child's ability to, to think rationally and make decisions. They're operating in fear or in anger instead of in confidence and in trying to solve problems. And I want to say the best and most influential form of training is through the example of us leading godly lives before our children. That is the best and most influential form of training our children, is providing that good example, showing them how life's problems are solved in a positive way, showing them what it means to trust the Lord, showing them what it means to be obedient to the Lord, and showing them what it means to to be kind to other people and to be thankful and to be, um, to be considerate around other people. When they see that lived out in us, they're going to live that out in their own lives because that's just the, who they are by, by what they've seen. If we desire to train our children in godliness, then we have to dis discipline ourselves to be godly. We have to restrain ourselves and train ourselves to be godly by reading and uh, following the word of God, seeking God, uh, godly counsel, being humble before God and others. Following the Lord in, in both word and deed. And closely related to that point about how we can be influencing our children by our own example, closely related to that is that we have to be careful about the influence of others upon our children, all right? We need to be careful about and understand that others will have an influence on our children. And our responsibility of, as, of, as parents to, to train our children means that we will restrict who gets to have an influence on our children. And we want to have that, that uh, that's a part of their training. Choose who your children will play with. Be protective of who has the opportunity to influence your children. And sleepovers and stayovers, they are usually a bad idea amongst kids. And let me say this, don't let Hollywood or video games babysit your children. Because that is a terrible influence on kids. We need to be selective about who, who gets to influence our kids. And there's times they're going to see things and hear things that just, they're not constructive, they're not good. You can say, wow, you can point out, wow, that was a bad response to that situation. How could that person have done that better? You can make learning uh, experiences out of bad, um, bad illustrations. You know, when, the per when a child sees something, they can, uh, you can make a good learning experience out of it, right? But don't let that be... Uh, the, the means by which we train our children. 
uh, video games and movies. That's not, uh, that's not their babysitter. Don't think for a minute that beatings, stripes, spankings, etc. are the only le legitimate means of discipline. That's really my big point in saying all this. As a, as a response to what we read in the newspaper about this other church, I want to make it really clear that we understand that this kind of discipline is not the only means of discipline. If you're unsure about how to discipline your children and, and, and who, who, feel, who felt when they had a child that they were absolutely thoroughly qualified to, be, to, to raise that children and they knew exactly how to handle every one of life's situations that would come up. I mean, I thought I, I, I had a pretty good handle. I had, you know, had a little bit of an idea, but it didn't take very long to, before I realized, wow, I am way over my head here. I'm going to need some help. We've got our help right here in the Bible. This is our help. We've got our help here amongst this, in this congregation and the counsel that we receive from one another. There are good resources within this church and, and that we can lay hold of for situations for when parents need a little bit of help and instruction on dealing with their children. And sometimes it can get frustrating and other times we can look back and say, wow, I probably should have handled that a little better. Well, we always know that there's, even with our kids, sometimes we have to come up to them and say, you know what, I didn't handle that as well as I should have. I'm sorry. Before honor comes humility, the Bible says. If you see, I'll close with this, if you see or hear of, of abuse, I think the best thing to do is treat it like it is an offense. As In, in Matthew there, it speaks of, if one offends you, go to that brother, speak to them one-on-one, -on -one, and if they won't hear you, take another brother or two with you and, and talk to them. If they won't hear that, then bring it to the church. Um, but ultimately, we seek a repentance. We seek that we would be drawn closer to the Lord and to walk more in his image so that we can be more like him so that we can raise our children to have a, a respect for the Lord because and a love for the Lord and to know that they have safety in the Lord because they've always felt that at home too. The love and respect that, they, that we have for them, that they will feel it, they will know it, they, they, will, they will feel confident in that. And then they go forward in that confidence. We want, we want to be an illustration of God's love upon our children so that when they get old enough to make that decision for themselves as to what they're going to believe, what they're going to follow, how they're going to serve the Lord or not, they will have seen the love of God already played out in their lives. And they will crave that. They will want that. They will see, that, so they will see the value in it and they will, they will understand the strength in it as well. And so we don't want to be uh, in the situation where we, because we don't understand or because we can't even control ourselves, we end up abusing our parental rights and the, the, even the rights of our own children because uh, of our mishandling of things. I hope this has been a blessing. It was on my heart. I wanted to say this, and I wanted to, to just lay this out here as just so you could hear it from the pulpit, Okay. So there wouldn't be any doubt as to what the Bible says, that their, their discipline is for um, the training of our children. Punishment is one of the tools in the toolbox, but it is certainly not the first one to be used, and it is certainly not the predominant one to be used, and it is certainly not the only one to be used. And so that is just, that's a last resort. Well, I shouldn't say last resort, but... Uh, in God's law, in the camp in the, of the Israelites in the wilderness, they had one more resort. And that's when after stripes and after punishment, uh, the parents could take their child to the elders and say, he won't listen no matter what we do. And the elders would take him out back and stone him. And he, that was that. And so that just shows you the, the level to which God demanded of his children and his uh, Israelites in the wilderness the level of obedience that he expected. And really, it's an illustration of what he expects from us because if we don't follow the Lord God, we're separated from him. And what awaits us in that separation is eternal death. 
And so uh, it's, a, it's an object lesson for us in, as well. But in the meantime, in love, we want to train our children. All right. Well, I'll stop with that. It didn't take quite as long as I thought it would, but um, uh, we'll go ahead and take a few prayer requests. We'll have